Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out top 10 British indie movies you need to see. Who needs blockbusters when you can watch these beauties? <laughs> welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 British indie movies you need to see. All right. Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Good advice. For this list, we take a look at the best of British independent cinema. From cult horrors to gritty gangster flicks, grab the popcorn and we'll get cracking. I'm gonna guess Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, Train Spotting. Um, that's all I can think of. In Bruges. In Bruges. I just saw that. That's an indie film? See, it's hard to know how a film was paid for or whether or not a studio was behind it. You know? Anyway, yeah. F me up. Hey, how's saying? That's for John Lennon. Number 10, Lock, <laughs> Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Hey. It's a ton. Jesus Christ, you could choke a dozen donkeys on that. Guy Ritchie's breakthrough movie, Lock, Stock, is still one of the Brit director's best efforts. Yeah. The film flits between fast-paced action, OTT violence, and spot-on humor, with cockney mobsters, loan sharks, drug dealers, and shootouts. <laughs> Released in 98, the cast list was bristling with established and rising stars, and it served as a starting point for one Jason Statham in particular. Yeah. Buy them, you better buy them. These are not stolen. They just haven't been paid for. If you can't get them again, they've changed the bloody locks here. One for you. Statham scored his first big screen role with Lockstock before becoming an internationally recognized shoe in for badass action hero roles. Yeah, that was a great film. Wow, it came out in 98. Is that 26 years ago? Oh my god. Age is a bitch. Great film. Really funny. I kind of liked uh, Snatch better though. I feel like something about Snatch that really brought his style into more focus. Like it was distilled down into more of concentrated elements of Guy Ritchie. Number 9. The Wicker Man. In the words that Wait, what? Action hero roles. Number 9. The Wicker Man. In the words that grew a tree. And a fine, fine tree was he. Forget Hang the on, embarrassing what? remake, Robin Hardy's original Wicker Man is an absolute classic. The film sees a pious police sergeant head to a small island off the coast of Scotland in search of a missing girl. But nobody on the island seems to have heard of her, not even her own parents. Hans of oh. every gentleman to stand up at attention. <laughs> And what's more, they're all into some strange pagan rituals involving sex and sacrifice. Set against beautiful idyllic backdrops, the eerie atmosphere makes for a terrifying and unsettling thriller, with mm. Christopher Lee at his very, very wow. best. And, and you, you so encourage young. them in this actively. It's most important. I, I've heard of the remake and I forgot that it was uh, a remake. Isn't that Nicolas Cage in it or something? Okay, yeah. I need to see the original. I feel like there have probably been other films that were based on this or made to be like an homage to this, like Hot Fuzz. Sounds kind of similar. A uh, big city cop going to a small town. This looks good. I need to see this. Number eight, this is England. Hello, I'm, I'm Harvey. I've come to give you Jim. <laughs> I've got one of these for you, sorry Jim. To Shane Meadows' acclaimed deconstruction of early 80s England and a fresh take on Thatcher's Britain. It's 1983 and we follow young Sean in his search for identity through his friendship with a skinhead gang. The group oh. is fractured upon the return of Combo, a hard right fanatic played by Stephen Graham, with the film charting the political and social turmoil of the time. This is England convinced critics upon that release, guy. winning Best Film at the 2006 British Independent Film Awards and inspiring a Channel 4 miniseries to continue its character stories. This is England, and this is England, and this is England. I recognize the bald guy because he was in Snatch. I've not heard of any of his other films oh he made a stone roses film interesting he made a film called la donk and scorsese scorsese is that a comedy oh musical documentary a british mock musical documentary a roadie working for the arctic monkeys our character is named scorsese and he's a rapper similar in format to this is spinal tap okay i gotta see this is england that might is be good england? And this is England, and this is England. He's a good Number actor. Number seven, Fish Tank. 
To I'm another hard-hitting drama, this time with Andre Arnold as director. Kate Jarvis stars as Mia, a young woman who's angry at the world and is struggling to find purpose and motivation in her life. Purpose. But things get even worse when her mother brings home a new boyfriend, in the form of Michael Fassbender's Connor, who strikes up a secret physical relationship with Mia. Jarvis delivers a show-stealing performance, while Fassbender received widespread praise for a standout role from his early career. Though unsettling at times, it's a must-see movie. That was really good. I love Michael Fassbender's acting. I think he's very good. Kind of a creepy premise. Fish tank. Why is it called fish tank? What's the what's the metaphor? Won the jury prize at 2009 Cannes Film Festival. Why have I not heard of it? Hey, marketing team for fish tank. What the what the f? Why wasn't this put in front of me? Oh, he shows her how to catch fish using her bear. Sexy. Oh, apparently they kill a horse in the film. I don't know if I could take that. This might be quite good. I gotta check this one out. Number six, Monty Python's Life of Brian. Oh. All right, I am the Messiah. <laughs> See, you can never tell when a, a movie is an indie movie. Monty Python's Life of Brian was an indie movie. Wow. A bonafide British institution, Monty Python have had various surreal, big screen success, but Life of Brian is probably the troupe's finest filmic achievements. Now you listen here! He's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy! Now go away! Brian, as everyone should know by now, <laughs> is not the Messiah, but he did have the misfortune of being born on the same day as the Son of God, in the stable next door to that which Mary, Joseph and Jesus frequented. Intelligent, funny, incredibly controversial, and eminently quotable, Life of Brian is indie comedy at its brightest. Yeah. What can you say? This, uh, yes. One of my favorite films ever made. This is amazing. Maybe this should probably be number one. Monty Python, how could it be, how could it be an indie film? Oh, I guess the subject matter probably pushed the major studios away. They're like, we don't want to make a movie about this. We don't want to deal with the... Backlash, and I think there was a lot of backlash from the Christians. I kind of remember hearing about that. Number five, The Man Who Fell to Earth. I realize you've made certain That's assumptions really about me. David Bowie takes the lead for this psychedelic sci fi under the famed directorship of Nicholas Rogue. Based on Walter Tevis' novel and made shortly before the release of the original Star Wars, The Man Who Fell to Earth pushes genre boundaries. A glittering example of what can be achieved without big studios getting in the way, Thomas Jerome Newton plays an alien on Earth to collect water to save his dying planet. And they'd, they'd take your body away, and then I'd have them send up another girl. It's a landmark British film, even though the story largely takes place in the deserted landscapes of New Mexico and Arizona. Hmm. <laughs> Not the cookies. Yeah, I didn't know this was an indie film either. I haven't seen it. I still need to watch this. This was this made a list of another video I reacted to. Haven't seen it yet. Looks good. This looks a little ridiculous, flipping a bunch of cookies like this is a big dramatic moment. Maybe it is, but it's kind of funny in this context. Number four, with Nail and I. I called him a punce. And now I'm calling you one. Punce! Director Bruce Robinson's hilarious high points, with Nail and I glides back and forth from funny to full-on bleak, with an endlessly quotable script. The story of two unemployed, down-on-their-luck actors who take a holiday together, the film showcases stellar performances from a blinding cast, including Richard E. Grant as the titular with Nell, and Richard Griffiths as the overly friendly Uncle Monty. Perhaps the last island of beauty in the world. A film set against a phenomenal soundtrack, including tunes from The Beatles and Jimi Hendrix, it's one to watch over they do and that? over again. I've looked into it. Listen to me, listen to me. There are things in there. There's a tea bag growing. No, I've never heard of this. How did they get songs from The Beatles and Jimi Hendrix? That's difficult to do. That's expensive. Loosely based on Robinson's life in London in the late 60s. Unemployed actors. I can relate. How did they get the songs? I'm curious. Peter Frampton worked as a makeup artist. I've met Peter Frampton. It was not a great experience, but that's all I have to say about him. 
Ringo Starr is credited as a spe special production consultant. Oh, that's how they got them. Okay, okay. Oh, Handmade Films. Is that George Harrison's? The film has an approval rating of 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's pretty good. Why have I never heard of this? With Nail and I marketing team. You dropped it. Get it in front of me. I want to watch this. They have All Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix. Voodoo Child. While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Is Handmade Films George Harrison's production company? Hang on now. And made films. It did The Life of Brian time, but yeah, I think it is. Yes, it is. Beatle George Harrison and business partner Dennis O'Brien. I love George Harrison. I think he's fantastic. I'm glad he's still alive. Number three, train spotting. I regret to inform, sir, credit limit was reached and breached quite some time ago. An undisputed cult classic, and based on Irvin Welsh's first novel, <laughs> Trainspotting follows the misadventures of four working class lads hooked on heroin in 90s Edinburgh. From its iconic opening to an unforgettable end, it's frantic, dynamic, and it doesn't pull any punches. Showing drug culture, brutal violence, and unconventional friendships, it's powered by star-making performances from the likes of Ewan McGregor and Robert Carlyle, trademark initiative direction from Danny Boyle, and probably one of the slickest soundtracks we've ever heard. Yeah, Trainspotting's great. I love the scene where he crawls into the toilet. Wonderful. Wonderful. I don't know what else to say about it. Great film. I didn't realize it was indie, but awesome. Number two, Kez. As you see, he started it. We could have included a number of Ken Loach's films today, but Kez has to be the director's best work. The story sees Billy Casper look after and train Kestrel, set against the backdrop of a late 60s mining town in Yorkshire. Oh. Adapted from Barry Hines's A Kestrel for a Knave, the film was largely shot on location with local actors, a move which prompted some American criticism because of the heavy accents. They got confetti on elastic, that's how giant fist it is. The language might be tough for those across the pond to grasp, yep. but Kez is one of Britain's best and most heartbreaking films. So I have, what are you going to do about it? You're going to kill yourself, that's what you want. Yeah, I'll probably have to cut out the actual clips of the film for YouTube, but they just showed some of the language, and I couldn't understand what they were saying. I think one of the words was confetti, but I don't know why he'd be saying confetti. Isn't it weird? That's the language I speak, but I can't understand them. So strange. Now, I've not heard of Kez. Jeez, this looks like maybe it's a hard watch. This kid just gets bullied by everybody. Mm. His interest in learning falconry prompts him to steal a book on the subject from a second-hand bookshop as he's underage and needs, but lies about the reasons he cannot obtain adult authorization for a borrower's card from the public library. He can't just check a book out from the library, he has to lie. Steal. Oof. That, that, that seems like a hard watch, honestly. I don't know if I'm going to check that out. Number one, if. You look evil. Huh? Uh. My face is a never-fading source of wonder to me. The winner of the Palm d'Or in 69 and the taker of today's crown, it's the film which first brought Malcolm McDowell to the big screen and the movie which confirmed Lindsay Anderson as one of the most respected and influential indie filmmakers in Britain. Your hair's still long. Get it cut. A clever satire of British society built around a boarding school, if moves from a relatively straightforward story of oppression and rebellion to become a standout cinematic experience. No authority figure is safe from Anderson's unmerciful eye, and it's a thrill to see. I've not heard of If. 1968. Oof. Another film about people being abused. I know it's kind of a theme, like, uh, abuse. Toxic relationships. I guess that's good drama. Children growing up around abusive adults, having to make poor choices to survive or to entertain themselves. It's a good indie film. Fauna. There's a few on here I need to see. The Wicker Man. This is England. Fish Tank. With Nail and I. There's some films on here I need to see. Thank you all for watching this with me, and I'll see you all next time. Later.